Any of you guys ready for a little time travel? All right, let's do it. It's easy, actually. We can just pretend that the year is 70, 1791. We are two years into the French Revolution. And in June, on a hot summer's day, the king of France, King Louis XVI, and his queen Marie Antoinette are prepared to flee the palace. They do this at night time in disguise. The plan is to meet with loyal troops and stage an attack on the capital to crush the revolution. This could actually have been done. The revolution at this point was still in its infancy, it was still weak. But as they were fleeing, they met one man. I give you a postmaster. Jean-Baptiste Doy. He sees the carriage with the disguised king and queen pass through his village and he recognizes the queen and the king, especially the king's inbred nose. <laughs> Doy jumps on a horse together with a friend and rides ahead of the king's carriage and he pushes a small cart onto a narrow bridge, blocking the king's escape route. The king is arrested is taken back to Paris and later executed after a meeting with Madame Guillotine at the Place de la Révolution. So everything could have been different. Just think about this. If we didn't have the French Revolution, what about democracy? What about human rights? What about nationalism? What about liberalism? I welcome you on a journey to the land of Ukraine. I'm a historian and I'm here to talk to you about history that didn't happen. That might strike me as a little odd, perhaps. Most of my colleagues are usually more interested in wie es eigentlich gewesen, how it really was in history. But, but I do firmly believe that as historians, as, 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 as human beings, we should also sometimes consider what could have happened in history. The, U, the Uchronias. This, you, you might be familiar with the term utopia, like the title of Thomas More's book, the, um, the place that is. Well, Uchronias are the times that never were from the French Uchronie. All these decisions never made, all the decisive battles never won, as Robert Frost put it, all the roads now taken in history. We're going to go down together a couple of these, of these roads. This is, this is not just an uh, academic excursion into theoretical landscape. It's also a personal journey, my personal journey. And it all began with a computer game. I was 14 years old when the first installment of Sid Meier's Civilization came out. Yeah, some of you know that. And yes, I skipped an entire week of school to play Civilization. <laughs> I don't feel bad about that because it has really saved me a couple of times when I later went to university to, to study history. This fantastic sandbox game where you just start out with a single settler uh, a couple of thousand years ago and then you just take it from there. All the options available to you prioritize your resources, make good choices or bad ones. Um, usually the game for me would end with me being invaded by the Germans. <laughs> that, that happens you know, occasionally, uh, also in real history. Uh, so, Usually it would be because I had prioritized badly. I had spent all my resources on art and uh, philosophy and not on chemistry and canon as the Germans. So uh, I would just reload again and try again. Go back 50 years, go back 100 years, try something else, just a little detail, just deploy one unit differently, just put one of my resources in another basket, and perhaps it worked. 
then it would take another hundred years before I would be crushed by the Germans. <laughs> That's learning by failing in history. Well, but so, so I got this idea about history as being a laboratory with a lot of variables and a lot of parameters that I could tinker with and try out. So I was really, really excited when I went to study history at the university. And boy, was I disappointed because that's not really how history is taught at the university, unfortunately. Uh, it seems to me that there is like basically two different approaches to understanding the moving forces, the driving mechanism of history. Either it's underlying laws of history, structures, economy, geography, mentality that governs everything, and that leaves very little room for free will and coincidence and individual action. And it, it, it results in very boring books, uh, I'm afraid. And then there's the, the other tradition describing single discrete events in history, uh, the big choices of the dead white men, but it's difficult to get a, a good understanding of the interdependence of history and the long-term perspective using that. So, so I, was really, I was really not uh, satisfied. I was actually quite frustrated, I must say, as a student of, of history. Uh, I remember uh, taking a course in 20th century history, very exciting, reading books about the breakout of the First World War, and, and you probably also, some of you heard about uh, the shots in Sarajevo that set up the first world war. I said, yes, oh, this is exciting. But all the authors, they, they took the story as an anecdote in the introduction to the history books. And then they would use somewhere between 400 and 600 pages to explain why it was not the shots in Sarajevo that caused the first world war. <laughs> Boring. Um, so, so I thought, oh, there must be another way. But I was so frustrated that I actually uh, thought about switching to math or physics in the hope of their finding like the truth, something that we can agree upon, like a definition. But I did not leave history. Instead I left Denmark, I went to the North Cape with a backpack. And traveling down the coast of Norway, I made a stop with my girlfriend in Trondheim. I went to the cinema. I watched a movie that changed my life. And that movie was called Sliding Doors, you might remember. It's basically just a sweet comedy, a, a romance about a girl who either misses a subway train or do not miss the subway train. And then the storyline branches out, splits into two parallel storylines, and it's, they show us how big the consequences can be of just a minor, almost banal event that we have all, we have all tried this, as we heard in, to, in, to, in the introduction. If we didn't go to that party, if I didn't go to, if that other guy was not, uh, didn't have to, to cancel his uh, seat at a specific dinner party, I would not have met my later wife that evening, all these things. This is very clear in the, in the, um, uh, in the, uh, in the movie in Slide Loss. So that, that really uh, got me, uh, got me thinking uh, and, uh, wondering about, could, could I use this for some kind of, of inspiration to look at history? Uh, it dawned upon me that uh, my discipline, history, was founded in the 19th century at a time when natural science was king. And when the founding fathers of history like, created the basic theory of history, they looked to the Newtonian world of natural science. And in that world, there is a proportionality between cause and effect. Input equals output. So that's where it came from. This idea among my fellow historians that for a big effect to take place in history, like the First World War, we need to look for a big course also. It cannot be a small thing that sets off a big thing. I was just wondering, I was just a little curious, could, there be, could it be that something happened in natural science after the middle of the 19th century? that we weren't aware of in my discipline. Yes, a couple of things actually happened after, after Newton. Uh, one of the things that happened was a great French uh, scientist called Jules-Henri Poincaré, who discovered that in some very special situations, some physical systems, the solar systems, the so-called free body problems, minor details can have a very, very big influence on the outcome. On the, sorry, on the outcome. And, and this was exactly what I was looking for. His way of thinking 
was elaborated further on in the 1960s and 70s by people like Edward Lawrence, the creator of chaos theory. One day I was reading about chaos uh, theory, and I, uh, I turned the page in the book, and I saw something called a Feigenbaum. That's a, like a visual representation, a graph that branches out instead of the old-fashioned, like Newtonian linear graphs. And I, was very, I became very inspired by this, and I started drawing <coughs> timelines like this. Instead of looking at history as something determined, something linear, or just dots on a paper, the, the singular discrete events, I thought that might be, that might be a like, dynamic interpretation of this, that at some point in history, we have even stretches that are characterized by predictability, and more or less proportional relationship between cause and effect. But we also sometimes have the pivotal moments. R history right there at the crossroads, going one way or the other way, and all it takes to tip the balance is just one little flap of a butterfly's wing. That was like a eureka moment uh, for me as a historian. When um, when historians talk about Uchronia as the times that they were born, we call it counterfactualism. Counterfactum in Latin, or against the facts. There are basically two different ways of approaching this. We can do what's called a contingency analysis, looking at the pivotal moment and evaluating the openness of this moment. Could it have gone any different? And the other approach to it is scenarios, scenario construction. What would have happened if it had gone differently from that pipe to moment, the different alternate branches? This is, a, uh, this is a powerful way of making an argument. One of the famous examples of this is an American economist, Robert Fogel. He was so tired of, of hearing again and again that railways was the most important factor in the development of American economic growth from 1850 onwards. So he did a big analysis, a book, he wrote a history of U.S. economy without railways. Mm -hmm. And he showed very convincingly that everything would have been different, but not necessarily any worse. They would just have used the waterways instead of railways, and that forced historians to look for other drivers and mechanisms for economic growth. That's a, that's, a, that's a powerful way of using a counterfactual argument. And basically, everything in history, when we write history, we always use counterfactual arguments in some way because history deals with causality, the relationship between cause and effect. And we cannot say that one thing led to another without at the same time saying that if that one thing had, if that had been different, then something else would necessarily have happened. So we always use this kind of counterfactual thinking. All right, let's uh, venture into the land of Uchronia a little deeper. First of all, we go back a couple of millennia to the year 9 AD in September, when three Roman legions were on the march through a German forest. The Roman uh, Empire was expanding at this time, and the plan was to expand across the River Rhine into this Germany, to the north and to the west. Unfortunately, the commander of these three legions had employed the son of a local chieftain, Arminius, as an auxiliary, as like a, the helping troops, to lead the way through this dense forest. And Arminius, he didn't really like the Romans, he just pretended to. So he set up an ambush, and he led 30,000 Roman soldiers into the forest, and then the barbarians attacked. They were crushed. It is said that Emperor Augustus, when he heard about this, his hair turned white overnight. Um, and just because of this basically minor mistake, this little decision to employ the wrong, the wrong guy as a field guide for your troops, the Roman Empire never expanded across the River Rhine. So it might be the reason why we're not speaking a Latin language in Denmark today. 
Fast forward. Remember the shots in Sarajevo that I just touched upon in the introduction. In uh, the end of June 1940, Archduke Franz Ferdinand was inspecting his troops in Sarajevo, in Bosnia, and he was not well liked in the Balkans. There were, in fact, assassins lined up all the way along his planned route, like a welcoming committee, <laughs> um, fighting for the reunification of the southern Slavs, the Yugoslavs. The first two assassination attempts failed. A bomb exploded, shrapnel from the bomb wounded an eight uh, in, the, in his throat, he was riding in another car, but nothing happened to the Archduke himself. Later in the day, he made a minor change to the schedule, to the plan, because he wanted to go and visit the wounded eight at a hospital. But the driver of his car was not told about this, so he took a wrong turn up Franz Josef's Tarsen, instead of going down the other car. The car was stopped right outside a coffee shop. And inside this coffee shop was Gabriel Princip, one of the other assassins. He thought everything had failed. Then he heard the noise from the Archduke's car, went out on the street, saw his target, drew his gun, and shot him. Ferdinand was killed. Five weeks later, the First World War broke out. If we are to accept that he did not start the First World War, then we have to argue why it would have started anyway without this assassination. Perhaps millions of soldiers died in vain in the battlefield. Perhaps he could just have missed his target. Fast forward again, 1944, Normandy. The D-Day invasion was uh, planned by experts, but still required a lot of detail to work out. The commander-in-chief himself Eisenhower, he was not sure that it would work, so the day before, he wrote uh, a note to himself for the press conference, in case D-Day failed. If it had failed, yeah, vielleicht würde ich dann jetzt Deutsch sprechen. I will leave you with a poem after this trip into the land of Ukraine. As usual, science has been slow to catch on. Folklore shows that people have known for ages that, with the right timing, small events can have major, major consequences. So, when you leave the venue later today, be on the lookout for butterflies. It might be you who are writing the history of the future. Thank you. <laughs>